Chapter 13. Hans Loppert. Poised between going on and back, pulled both ways taut, uh, like a tightrope walker. Fingertips pointing the opposites. Now bouncing tiptoe like a drop ball or a kid skipping rope. Come on, come on. Running a scattering of steps sideways. Wise. How he teeters, skitters, tingles, teases, taunts them, hover, hovers or like an ecstatic bird. He is only flirting, crowd him, crowd him. Delicate, 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 delicate now. Robert Francis, the bass dealer. No kidding, are you sure that's right? That's except for Connie Mack. I've been in baseball longer than anybody else in this whole, the whole history of the game. That's really hard to believe. Let's see, I started with the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1903. They sent me to Des Moines, Iowa in the Western League in 1904. 1905, I jumped to Johnston town in the tri-state league and came up with the chicago cubs in the fall of that year uh in 1905 1906 cubs trade me to the cincinnati reds for harry steinfeld which rounded out the greatest infield that they had for so many years ever chance evers tinker and steinfeld if that trade hadn't been made it would it have been Chance, Ever, Stinker, and Lobert, I guess. I played for Cincinnati from 1906 through 1910, for the Phillies from 1911 through 1914, and then finished up with three years under on McGraw on the Giants. There are a lot of Giants players in, on this book, if you've noticed. After my playing days were over, I coached at West Point from... 1918 to 1925, and four of those years, we were under MacArthur, and then went back to the Giants as a coach for four years. The Giants sent me the manager of Farm Club in Bridgeport in the Eastern League in, from 1929 through 1931. Then I managed Jersey City for a while, and from 1934 to 1941, I coached the Phillies, Managed them in 1942, and that was enough to end in a beautiful friendship. So in 43 and 44, I coached for Cincinnati. And since 45, I've been a scout for New York and San Francisco. So that's it. Sounds more like a travel log than a history, life history, isn't it? It really isn't as much traveling as it sounds, though it's mostly the Giants, Phillies, and the Reds. Once you stop to think about it, but it does add up. Over 60 years in baseball, that's almost impossible for me to believe. I still remember back in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, when I grew up there, there was a team called Demersoing Machines that played only a few blocks from where we lived. And I used to sneak into the games all the time. I used to crawl under the fence so I would have to pay my 10 cents. I must have been 10, or I wouldn't have to pay my 10 cents. I must have been about 10 years old, which means it was around 1890 or so. Well, the day I'm thinking of, it's the day the ticket taker caught me. He'd seen me crawling under the fence before, and he'd never been fast enough to catch me. This time, I must have been careless. He grabbed me and dragged me up in the front of the ticket office, where they had a great big ugly bulldog chained to a post. He chained me to another post right next to the bulldog. But just beyond his reach, just barely, that was a, to teach my, me a lesson. So I wouldn't do it again, I guess. He kept me there for about four innings, and all the while I'm getting more and more scared. I could see myself in jail with my father coming down to get me out, and a whole lot worse. Although at the age of 10, I'm not sure what could possibly be worse than that. Finally, he unchained me. And he says, well, wh well, what are you going to do now? I'm going to watch the game, I said. And I ran in like the devil. But the next day, I was right back heck, crawling under the fence again. We were late. A few years later, we moved to a little town right outside of Pittsburgh. My father was a cabinet maker, but we made... It about ten cows to, or we had about ten cows too, and every morning my brother and I would get up at four in the morning, 
and milk the cows and deliver the milk and take the cows to the pasture or before we went to school. We had the cows, but we didn't really live out on a farm. We'd take them to a pasture on a big farm nearby. That's where I got my first baseball uniform. I was about 15, and I guess I was playing on, a, on some little immature team, and they got us uniforms. Boy, I'll never forget it. I slept in it, it that night. It, they couldn't get that thing off my back. But I still didn't have a pair of baseball shoes. That same year, my dad gave me $3.50 for Christmas. What are you going to do with all that money? He asked me. I'm going to buy a pair of the best baseball shoes I can find, I told him. And I went downtown to Pittsburgh and got a pair of Spalding fe Featherweights, which were just $3.50 at the time. When I got back home, it was snowing out, but I couldn't wait to try them on. I put the whole uniform on in the new shoes and ran outside as quick as I could. I can still see my mom and dad washing me out the front window. I could hardly see them. It was snowing so hard with me out, out there dancing in the snow in those beautiful shoes. I played every chance I could get, and late in my teens, I started to play third base with the semi-pro club in Pittsburgh. The uh, Pittsburgh ACs naturally live in near Pittsburgh, and all my idol was Honus Wagner. And I tried to do everything just like he did. I tried I to walk like him, him too. Wagner lived in a Carnegie, um, which wasn't far from where we lived. And lots of times I'd see him out there playing baseball with kids after the Pirates games were over. Wonderful man he was. One September day in, of 1903, after I'd been playing with the Pittsburgh ACs for a few years, we took a trip to Atlantic City to play a, a game there. It so happened that Barney Dreyfus, who was the president of the Pittsburgh Pirates, happened to be in Atlantic City at the time, and he watched the game from the stands. After it was over, he but <clears throat> tunneled me. Where do you live, young man? He says to me. In Pittsburgh, sir. Is that so? He says. How would you like to come out to Exposition Park and have a trial with the pirates? What could I say? I gulped and stammered something. And I guess he got the idea. Because next week, there I was in Exposition Park over in Al again, any, uh, Which is where the pirates used to play in those days. This was in September of 1903. I remember the year because that was the year the Pirates won their third pennant in a row and they had the first in the first World Series ever. The Pirates and the Red Sox. I sat on the Pittsburgh bench during that World Series and the Red Sox won. So I went over to Exposition Park I, like Mr. Dreyfus asked me to and started to get into the clubhouse. There was a big fellow at the door who turned that out to be the trainer. Where do you, what do you want here? He says, real gruff and tough, scared the tar out of me. I told him why I was there, and he finally let me in. When I got inside, I didn't know what to do, so I began to look for Fred Clark, the manager. All the players were there, you know, getting dressed and everything, and I felt like a real big shot, and nobody, both at the same time. While I'm looking for Mr. Clark, I'm mostly looking in a, out of the corner of my eye at the players to see who I, I recognized and what they really look like. Like Honus Wagner, Tommy Leach, Ginger Beaumont, and the rest. I guess I must have looked uh, sort of lost because all of a sudden Wagner, of all people, yells to me, Hey kid, come over, on over here you, and use my locker. Oh, no, Mr. Wagner, I said. Hey, I have to find Mr. Clark. He won't be here for 20 minutes yet, Wagner said. Meanwhile, come on over and get dressed here. So I did, and I really felt like a big shot then. Honus Wagner asked me where I was from, and when he, he found out I lived near him, and my, my name was John, or Jonas, the, the same as his, he asked call. He started calling me Hans, number two. Actually, he did look a little bit um, alike, or we did look a bit alike. 
especially our noses. From then on, he always called me Hans number two. For all the 50 years we knew each other, I've always been proud of that. I stayed with the Pirates for the rest of the year and got in about five games. The first one was against the New York Giants, and Joe McNinney was the pitcher. Boy, he was a peak then. He won over 30 games in 1903 and 1904, both. That's when he was pitching double headers and all. I think he pitched the, at least three double headers that year, 1903, and won both of the games each time. Well, in the first game, I didn't get any hits until about the eighth inning, and I came up for the fourth time that McNitty he got two quick strikes on me. Both curveballs, and all he threw underhand curveballs, and one after the other, but the two strikes on me bunted down the first baseline and beat it out. When I went to my position in the next inning, Giant manager John McGraw was coaching at third base, which was where I was playing. Say, young man, he said, who ever taught you to bunt with two strikes on you? Nobody did, I said, but I like to bunt, and nobody was looking for a busher to, keep, to do that. Well, well, you keep it up, he said. That's the way to keep them on, on their toes. And he and I became friends from that day on until he, he died. After that season, the Pirates sent me down to Des Moines, Iowa in 1904. And in 1905, I was with John Onstown, hit 337 there, and stole 57 bases. So at the end of the season, the Chicago Cubs bought me. Like I said, though, they traded me to Cincinnati before the 1906 season began in order to get Harry Steinfeld. So in 1906, I started to play regular in the big leagues at shortstop and third base with the Cincinnati Reds. Ned Hanlon, who used to manage the old Baltimore Orioles, was the manager of the Reds. When I came up, up to, and later it was Clark Griffith. That was the Griff bought the Washington club. Cy Seymour was there, and Miller Hugens and Jimmy Delahanty, and later Bob Brasher, and Dodd, and Paskert. That was a very fast team around that time, you know. One year, Bob Besher, Busher, whatever, stole about 80 bases. Paskert stole about 50, and I stole about 40. Andy Coakley was a pitcher on that at Cincinnati team, him too. Quite a guy, and Andy had graduated from Holy Cross, and he was a great fellow to have around in the middle of an argument. He'd come out with being unable to assume an initial premise with any tolerable degree of accuracy. I am loath to assert or to conclusion, fearful let as I should err. Andy and I saw a lot of each other many years later. When he was coaching in Columbia, I was at West Point. Every time we got together at one and or the other of us would sp spout that out before we'd even say hello. Of course, I'm making it all sound like it was a joy ride, but those days were very rough. It wasn't easy to break into the big leagues then like it is now. I still remember the famous day Rube Marquardt made his debut with the Giants. I mean, it's still hard to get into the big leagues now. But uh, anyway, we were the uh, opposition. It was in 1908, very late in the season, only a couple days after the Merkel incident. I think the Merkel incident happened in, on September 23rd, and on Friday on 25th, McGraw started Merkel. Rube against us in the first game of a doubleheader. New York was an uproar over the Merkel thing, and everybody was also excited about Marquad, the $11,000 beauty that McGraw had just bought from Indianapolis. The polo grounds was jammed to the rafters. Well, this kid, I don't think Marquad was 19 years old yet. Marquad, excuse me, was so nervous he couldn't do a single thing right. He hit the first man up in the ribs. Then I tripled and Bob Besher or tripled all in the first inning. And suddenly they start calling the $11,000 beauty the $11,000 lemon. Just a kid, you know. It was rough. He showed them a few years later, though. He had, had the stuff. Also, playing conditions were very primitive then. 
The fields were bumpy and the gloves were nothing compared to today. You know, we were only permitted to have 17 men on a club, not 25 like they have now. If you get banged up, too bad. You had to play. Actually, I believe there are a greater number of better players around today, but they're not as rugged as we used to be. We didn't have have any choice, you see. For instance, we didn't have any training in facilities to speak of. The trainer in those days had to take care of the uniforms and the equipment and and everything else. Just one man, he didn't know know any more about health or medicine, just the man in the moon. No doctors, of course. If somebody got hurt, the old cry would go out, Is there a doctor in the stands? I remember once in 1907, I think it was, I got hit in the head with a pitch, and we were playing the Cubs. Orvi overall was pitching for them. He and I had a room together for the year before when I was first came to Cincinnati, and then he got traded to the Cubs. I had three balls and then and one strike on me, and Ned Hanlon yelled, Make him pitch to you, Hans! Well, if Hanlon and called your first name, you meant to to hit so as you as I, as soon as I heard Hans I knew I was to hit the next pitch overall let go with a high fast one and it hit me a smack on the temple I thought I was down about five seconds but it was about 10 minutes even so when I came up I had to stay in the game they didn't have anybody else to put in Every step I took, I felt the ground was coming up to meet my feet or I was stepping into a hole, but I had to to stay in there. I thought I was getting over it after a week or two, but then suddenly I started to get a plate shy. I couldn't stand up there at the plate and I began to get terrible headaches every night. I couldn't see the ball very well either. It was September by then and our position was pretty set. So I asked Mr. Hanlon if I could go home for the rest of the season. When I got home, went to a doctor for the first time, and he said I had a concussion. So it was a different setup then, too. Boys were pretty rough. They were beer drinkers. They never drank hard liquor like people think they do, or they did. After the game, we would go have a couple glasses of beer, and every drink, ink, and few drink anything else it wasn't until prohibition and came in and years later uh, that there was very much drinking besides a beer or two there were lots more drinking during prohibition and during than before or since i didn't even drink beer when i first came up i'll never forget in cincinnati we were sitting in a restaurant Joe Kelly, Jimmy Delhanty, Cy Seymour, Shad Berry, Larry McLean, and myself, and they wanted me to join them and I and have a beer. Now I said I don't drink beer, I never tasted it. Boy, they all grabbed me, held me and started pouring this beer in my face. I kept my mouth closed and soon I had all beer all over me. Finally I had enough. Okay, I said, cut it out, I'll take a glass of beer. In the spring of 1911, Dodd Paskert and I were traded to the Philadelphia Phillies. A new rookie in the Phillies camp for the first time that spring was a new was a fellow by the name of Grover Cleveland Alexander. As you know, Alex got to drinking very heavily later in his career, but to the best of my knowledge, he hadn't drank all, at all at the time. He was really something back then. I was with the Phillies for four years, 1911 through 1914. He and was a very terrific in those day, those years. In his rookie year, 1911, Alex won 28 games. And at one point that season, he pitched four shutouts in a row. And the thing is, he wasn't at his peak yet. From 1915 till 1917, he won 30 or more games in each season. 1916, he had 16 shutouts for a right-handed pitcher in Baker Bull in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where we played then. That was almost impossible to believe. 
The right field fence was only 280, 280 feet away and cut straight over to center field. Park was heaven for a left-handed hitter. Alex was a really an amazing hit, pitcher. It still he had a little short fingers and John and he threw a very heavy ball. One once later on, when I moved over to the Giants, Alex hit me over the head with the pitch ball and it bore in like a lump of let of lead hitting, you know. I could get I couldn't get my breath for ten minutes afterward, just like the one incident with the Reds. Maddie was just as fast, but <clears throat> he didn't have, have a much lighter ball. Anyway, like I said, Alex didn't drink when he first came up. He didn't really start to drink heavily until he came back from the from World War One in nineteen nineteen. He wasn't any younger than he came up up either he must have been 24 25 by then i guess he started baseball pretty late he was a great guy and one of the a f- fine build now you know they always seem to remember alex as an old man and they if they the only thing you hear about him as he w- came in later in the age of 39 and struck out tony Lazari. To save the 1926 World Series for the St. Louis Cardinals, but in those days he went any th- he wasn't any 39 years old. He was in his 20s and he had a wonderful constitution. Funny thing is he ran never ran like pitchers are supposed to. He get around third base and field some ground balls, and that would be that. Alex's big problem was that he. Took a left fits on the bench. And that continued all the years we played together. Maybe two or three times a season he'd have a epileptic seizure on the bench. He'd froth at the mouth and shiver all over the thrash around him. And sort of lose consciousness. We'd hold him down and open his mouth and grab his tongue to keep him from choking himself. It was awful. I know I shouldn't be laughing. After we'd gotten him down, we'd pour some brandy down on his throat, and in a while, he'd be all right. Always happened on the bench, though, never out on the pitching mound. Always kept a bottle of brandy handy because they never were was any warning. Alex wasn't the only epilepsy Dick on the Phillies at the time. Sherry Maggie in the outfield had an epilepsy too. Tony Lazari with the Yankees later on. I remember one Sunday when I was on the Phillies. We all went over to Atlantic City. We didn't play Sunday baseball in those days in the Philadelphia. Monday we we got back. Was beastly hot uh, that day. And Sherry McGee had been drinking and had a hangover. We were playing the St. Louis Cardinals that day, and Bill Finneran was umpiring behind the plate. He called a ball a bad strike on Sherry. We caught, we would all see that McGee was about to get Owen to a fit. He started frothing at the at his mouth, and he went in at Finneran like a crazy man. Finneran had his mask on, and Sherry he hit him in the in his mouth. Knocked him down, and before we could get at him, or before we could get the air and stop him, excuse me, Sherry was suspended for about a month and for that. 1915, I was traded to the New York Giants, and after 10 years, it was in the big leagues, I finally got to play under John McGraw. That was a great thrill. For me, actually, I already knew John McGraw pretty well because he'd taken me on his world tour in 1913. He took two teams around the world that winter. We were called, the, of course, the Giants and the White Sox, but we weren't really yeah, the Giants and White Sox. I was on the Phillies then, and I went and along, and so did Sam Crawford, who was on the Tigers, Tris Beaker from the Red Sox, Germany Schaefer, from the Washington Senators, 
and a few others who weren't really on the White Sox or the Giants. That's what we were called. Giants, White Sox, but weren't. Anyway, we left in 1913 on October 18th, which is my birthday, and got back March 6th, 1914. That was my honeymoon trip, too. We all took our wives and had a great time, but toured the United States for a month. Then went to Japan and China and Australia, Egypt, Italy, France, England, and Ireland. We were almost finished with the American part of the tour. We played a game in Oxnard, California, which was Fred Snodgrass's hometown. It was something I'll never forget. It was one of the most bizarre incidents I have ever took part of. We arrived in Oxnard at about 7 in the morning, and we were meeting at the train by the about 10 stagecoaches, in which they took all of us out in this big ranch for a huge barbecue. There was great cattle in Lima Bean country around there or then. They had this tremendous ox roasting and been roasting in it for a couple of days and lima beans with onions and and beer. That was our breakfast. But did you ever try roasted ox and beer or for breakfast? Not bad. Puts hair on your chest, to say the least. After that, we had finished all this great food and the mayor of the town got up and put me on the spot. He asked me if I would race a horse around the bases that afternoon. Lord, I said, I'm not here to run horses around the bases. I'm here to play baseball. But he wouldn't take no for an answer. McGraw finally talked me into agreeing to it. So I was very fast in those days in a field at Cincinnati a couple years before. I had circled the bases at 13 in four-fifths seconds from a pistol start. As far as I knew, that's all a record. That's still a record. Tommy Leach had the record for or 14 one fifth seconds, which he had made in 1907. The idea was that first we'd play the game, and then after or the game, I'd race the horse. Afternoon came, and we started the game, but it was very difficult to play. Nobody wanted to see the game. They all wanted to see this race between me, the man and the horse. There was a huge crowd there, maybe 5,000 people packed into those little rickety stands. And out in the outfield, there must have been several hundred cowboys or horseback watching the game. Or on horseback. I learned later that there was a terrific amount of local waggering amount among the cattlemen and the cowboys who would win on who would win me you or the horse. The cowboys kept creepily being in the closer and closer till we hardly had any room left to play. So along about the seventh inning, John McGraw came to me and said, Hans, John, that's his real name, Hans, but we'll call him Hans. Hans, that rhymes. We can't finish this game. You might as well get ready to run the horse around the bases. Then from the mass of cowboys encircling in the outfield out steps this most beautiful black animal you ever saw with the Mexican cowboy on him, all dressed up in chaps and spangles. Both he and the horse were glittering like jewels in the sunlight. The horse was a beautiful black, coal black cow pony that was trained to make a very sharp turn. Cowboy couldn't speak English, so oh, I said, Senor, practice go. Well, take a practice around, walk around the bases. So we walked around the crowd, roaring and the moving picture cameras whirring. Pathé News was there. I was to touch the inner corner of each base, and he was to go around the ho- the outside so as not to run me down. Finally, everything was all set. Bill Clem was to be the referee, and we were ready to go. Pistol started us, and off we went. I led at first base by at least five feet, and by second base, I had picked up and was about ten feet ahead. I was in perfect stride, hitting in George bet each bag with the, my right foot and going faster all the time, but instead of the horse keeping his distance, he crowded me between in second and third, and I had to 
uh, dodge to be avoid being knocked down. I broke stride and that was the end. I was still in front as we rounded third, but not by much. And on the home stretch, the horse just did beat me. Ian, I still think I would have have had at one if I'd been practically bowled over at shortstop or hadn't been. Bill Clem M was the horse said the horse won by a nose. But as you can plainly see, that was highly unlikely.